live. And this Hangout on Air is definitely live. And I'm definitely with Marla Pavlin. And Marla, you're uh, located in which part of uh, the US? Uh, San Francisco, California, in the one US. The, one of the best parts. Yeah, it's a great weather and a fantastic arts culture out here. Absolutely. And I'm really looking forward to uh, um, meeting with you to discuss a number of things, not just Google Glass, but also your, your involvement in that art community. Uh, Myla, as you would understand, my name is Alexander Hayes, and I'm uh, uh, conducting research on behalf of a number of different centres, but principally the University of Canberra. And I, I, I wondered, you know, I've got a, three of your profiles online, and I've heard about you through with Cecilia and the Glass Explorer community, but if you were in a lift, Myla, and say we had not three floors, but we had 12 floors um, with which to hear about who you are and what your pitch is and so on, what, what would it be? Well, I'm a game developer and an artist, and what I really see is a future in which uh, games are integrated into everyday life. And I would really love to see applications with Google Glass and with wearable technology that allow you to gamify the everyday world. So everything that you do from brushing your teeth to going to work could all be into a game integration. Um, I really think that, that life is really about having fun and enjoying yourself, and I think that this wearable technology is actually at a point in which we can integrate those things in a very meaning, meaningful and contextual way to make your everyday experiences even that more, much more fun. That's, that's that, kind of my, my pitch in it. Absolutely, and that's, that's, um, that was a very fast 12 floors, but we need to better understand, Myla, where would we go and find out more about your amazing work online? Um, so, I mean, I, I do have a, an Art on Bart blog, um, artonbartsf.blogspot.com, where you can see my, um, my digital art that I do, as well as on my Google, uh, Google Plus page, uh, where I, do, I put up a lot of my artwork that I'm working on. Unfortunately, a lot of the development work I'm doing right now is really secret, because uh, we're trying mm -hmm. to, to work on some stuff to really break ground in, uh, in, game, in gamification and day-to-day uh, -day use. But as that comes available, I'll certainly put out put out more. Um, I also have a DeviantArt account, which I can certainly link to, which is genopunk.deviantart.com, um, which I have a bunch of my concept art and sketches on. Um, but really what uh, I'm interested in is pushing those boundaries around gamification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely perfect. And so what I'll do is put those links in with this interview so that people can see your work uh, uh, post this time when we're meeting. I'm really grateful that you met today. I, I had failed to remember that it was actually daylight saving there, so I'll have to let Libby know that yeah, I'm, a, I'm an hour ahead of, of, of everyone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we've connected. Uh, Myla, the arts, uh, which is very dear to my heart, it's my background, uh, where do you see the connect uh, most silently realised between, say, the object, the subject, and uh, that of glass, given that uh, Nicholas Bouriard, who's famous for the term relational aesthetics, he, he thinks of glass, uh, particularly in the context as to where um, you know, the viewer completes an artwork. Without the viewer, the artwork is not a complete uh, entity. What's your thoughts on where glass could play in the arts picture? Well, the traditional viewing of art is really an interaction between the individual and the art. And first you have uh, the initial viewing and the, and the taking in of the art and um, examining those kind of aspects of, of how you personally interact with it. But with glass, you actually have this opportunity as the artist and also as, the, as other individuals to interact with art in kind of a deeper way. So uh, although it's not a necessity for, for art, everyone has their own interpretation of how they, how they experience an artistic piece. Um, there's that opportunity of contextual relationships and also with utilizing glass to be able to, um, in the moment, display information from the artist or uh, perhaps even integrate music or other images into a viewing so that you have a separate layer that's beyond just what's there on a, um, on a surface level. So I really have seen a lot of people pushing the boundaries around using mobile technology uh, to do art. Um, especially in the music industry where people are having uh, symphonies that are happening in parks where it's all contextual based on your geolocation. Imagine if you could do the same thing with art, where you're walking around a city that, um, you know, instead of it just being brick walls, you actually have graffiti that's virtually in place uh, on your glass 
that you can see because you're uh, that you're actually activating it based on your geolocation or based on augmented reality. So I think the integration of more advanced um, aug augmented reality into glass as we get more and more technology around that, um, that this is actually going to really push the boundaries of what you can do with glass. Um, mm. Just our initial experiments with it, you know, you can use geolocation to actually plant art into locations and have secret galleries or, you know, places that people walk into that are not visible to anyone else except for somebody who's using an app. So those things are, are really exciting in the implementation of, uh, of art in spaces. And then mm -hmm. also the relationship to being able to look at a piece of art and maybe get historical background, um, get the artist's context, and actually you know, hear more about it. I feel mm -hmm. that when you know more about art, that you actually can enjoy it in a deeper level, in a deeper way. And uh, you know, in that relationship between the artist and the viewer, sometimes there's a disconnect that can be filled by having that information available to you on a contextual basis. It's very clear to me, Marla, that you're thinking about art as being a, a full immersion um, experience. And uh, so do you think that perhaps the, the, the day for holding, say, a tablet up or a phone up in order to uh, get that AR experience is well and truly gone with glass? Is that, has glass become... Uh, the connect into that full experience? I think that's, that's really, it's an interruptive and disruptive technology in that um, when you have to hold your phone up to, to a screen to view it, you're really, you're having to, you know, use your whole body, you're having to mm. really interact with something. It's a very conscious and deliberate effort that you need to make. With glass, you can actually set up programming that would recognize images. So let's say you're in a gallery, you could actually set up uh, you know, image-based recognition, you turn on the app, you're able to see an image, and it just brings up the information to you immediately without you having to take that effort or that extra step to have to mm. bring the phone or the tablet out. Plus, who wants to carry around a heavy phone or heavy tablet as you're walking through a gallery? And in some places, it's even might even be, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to actually hold up your phone because of the restrictions. Whereas with glass, you're actually, it's part of your everyday experience, and you're getting that information exactly when you need it through the contextual awareness. Mm. It, brings, it brings to mind for me, um, we, we live in, I'm living in the Asia-Pacific region, and glass isn't yet in this environment. Um, in, in that context, a lot of art galleries or institutions that display artworks, don't, or for, they actually forbid people from taking images, photos, and so on. How is this? <laughs> it's likely to very much interrupt that cycle, isn't it, if people are wearing a device that has the potential to take images and video. There's a big, uh, I mean, I think there's a big debate around the video and image, um, you know, in public spaces. And, mm. you know, in San Francisco, we're very fortunate that a lot of the museums allow you to take photos, but just not flash photography. And since mm. Google Glass doesn't have an in, in uh, doesn't have a flash integrated into it as of yet, um, that wouldn't violate the terms of service there. And in fact, at some of the big museums in San Francisco, you're actually encouraged to take photos as well. But um, I understand that in a private environment in which someone's not allowed to take photos, I was actually um, on a tour of a building um, at one point, and they actually made me remove my glass because I was mm. wearing it. And they, you know, they said, "Well, you can't have any photos inside," which I thought was a very interesting thing because they they cited it as a safety concern that they didn't want people to be concentrating on taking photos rather than being, you know, safe within the building. Whereas, you know, really, glasses, uh, you know, you can take photos fairly effortlessly and without mm -hmm. much thought. So I think that that's going to be one of the key points around this technology as to whether or not it gains a full social acceptance. Is whether people can get over the fact that you have a readily accessible camera and video, you know, on hand and also understanding the limitations of that. Just like mm -hmm. anybody can take a photograph with a, with a cell phone, you know, at a moment's notice, uh, you know, it, it, there's no real difference between the functionality that you're receiving from glass versus your cell phone, but you can just, with the glass, you can actually do that surreptitiously. So that's I think right. that's where the main concern comes in. That's where a lot of the big discussions are. Before we go into talking about surveillance or surveillance in any way, let's talk about bookshelves. It just occurs to me that you have the most fascinating bookshelf. I have a very, you can see, an arts-laden with all sorts of uh, texts around artwork, but you actually have a real bookshelf with real artwork in it. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the bookshelf that I can see within my field of view? 
So th this is actually a collection of, uh, of maquettes. Uh, maquettes are used in animation for, um, for artists to be able to reference the, um, the different angles of a, of a character. The ones you're seeing behind you are mostly from Bruce Timm the, with the Justice League series. Um, big fans of the Justice League, the Justice League series, and the, that kind of um, animation, that animation style that Bruce Timm brought to, uh, you know, brought to life through that. And mm -hmm. I think that surrounding myself with art constantly, I mean, the whole house is just filled with art. And whether it's art that I've done or whether it's art that other people have done, I believe that that really drives this kind of creative chaos to bring more ideas. You know, mm -hmm. somebody once told me that you're you're only limited in your in, in art based on your imagination, and you build your imagination through your visual library. So those those books of uh, of images are are fantastic, um, but also having 3D images around you everywhere is just I think drives that creativity to a, a to a new level. Absolutely, I remember it well with having a studio filled with chaos. Bottles of wine, three D form of two, of, of course, as well. <laughs> Speaking about uh, real artworks, um, can you tell us a bit about your G plus club image? Uh, what do you see happening around the globe with fashionable glass interventions? Because that image really paints a, a futures picture of glass as being a location based um, experience, perhaps a socialized experience. So how successful has glass been socialized, do you think? Well, one of the things that I noticed about glass immediately after receiving it is that everyone wants to talk to me when I'm wearing it. And as an introvert and somebody who doesn't often talk to people, uh, it's a very jarring experience at first to suddenly be thrust into a situation in which people want, want to speak to you. And complete strangers will ask you questions, sometimes inappropriate, sometimes appropriate, sometimes just inquisitive. and you know, those experiences are really, um, it's really stunning how it breaks us out of our shell, especially when, um, like I ride on the train for 45 minutes each way to San Francisco, and that whole way people now want to converse with me while I'm in that, you know, in the train, whereas before it was just this silent kind of, uh, you know, drudgery that would happen on the train every day. So I really saw glass as being a social breaker. It, it's something that allows you to move from that point of stagnancy to a point of actual conversation. So bringing people back from just looking at your phone constantly to actually looking up and speaking to other people and still being able to interact with your technology, which I think is something that's lacking in our current non-wearable technology, is that you have to look mm -hmm. down constantly in order to interact with it. So mm -hmm. when creating that image, really, you know, the the folks from uh, from Google sent the, sent an image over these two folks who are in a, you know this kind of passionate embrace, and I thought. You know, they really, it really seems to me that they are not, um, they're not just in this world of, um, of what we're seeing, the mundane. They're in something more fantastic. And uh, so thinking back to, you know, all the old sci-fi movies that I really loved, uh, I wanted to, to show a vision of the future that really integrates that um, and all the social functions into something that's more, um, like, the G Plus Club to me represented something that's just a really, a future of social interaction and technology interacting together in kind of a, a deeper and fundamental way mm. as opposed to being this really separate these two worlds of like you know you go online and you have one life and then you have your your in you know in real life social life what if those two things could be really integrated and really the same so. yeah a lot, a lot of people would prefer they were very much very separate because they have very separate lives in that re respect I'm wondering though I'm seeing a great deal of um, um, and getting a great of sense of connectivity with the, the uh, Google uh, Glass Explorer community. Do you find do you find that is the main hub for where Glass um, creativity innovation is happening, or is there somewhere else that, say, an educator, a teacher, could hang out to learn more about how this particular technology might affect them? You know, I think that the the Google Glass Explorers groups are really they're really a tight-knit group at the moment because there are so few people who are actually experiencing the technology that it's really important for people to stick together and to explore this on a on kind of a level that um, that other folks who are not in the Explorer program, you know, it's it's really difficult for them to to understand the experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the group really gets together and um, is there's this buzz of energy that that comes with being around other people who are using Glass because everyone has so many ideas. 
and the everyday the everyday usage of Google Glass right now is ex is is exploding. So you have these new technologies that are emerging. You have these new apps that are emerging. Um, you have new ways that people are using the technology. Even though it's very similar to the same technology that we've had for a long time, people are seeing so many more ideas flourishing in those groups. So I really see this as this incubator that's happening right now that's, that's paving the, the road for other folks uh, once, the, once it opens up to the general public. I mean, I do feel like Google Glass is in a state where it's still very much a beta product. Um, you know, there are definitely some technical challenge that, chal challenges that need to be overcome before it's ready for the general public. But the, the possibilities of wearable technology are so limitless that mm -hmm. it's hard to really explain to somebody who's outside of the, outside of the group, I guess. Most definitely. Myla, um, on a more personal level, I, I note that there was, a, well, there was a G Plus message that, that it was presented to me when I first went on to G Plus looking at your work, and it said, there are no photos of Myla. Upload and tag her now. So how comfortable are you in knowing that it's, in, it's inevitable, or at least what are your thoughts on those people that don't want to be captured by glass? Uh, how will they know apart from the fact there's no LED in indicating that, that that person may be taking a photo or not, how will they know that they're not being made subjects for future identification? You know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because I hadn't actually realized that I had never uploaded a photo of myself, so I've actually got one that I'm going to be uploading today um, just so that that picture or that won't that message won't come up again. Um, <laughs> but I speak, I speak through my art. You know, really my art is what um, what drives me. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold, so I really apologize. No, totally fine. I'm recovering from one myself, for sure. Yeah, um, but what I really think is uh, is out there is that many people don't don't mind that their that their um, that their pictures are out there. What they really mind is that people are taking pictures without their permission. And so I think that we need to develop a culture of people um, being very very vocal about uh, actually asking permission to use people's photos and. Uh, we're in a much more connected world, so when you're snapping a picture, you're not um, you're not taking somebody's um, you know image without their permission, which mm -hmm. actually came up for me a lot because I do a lot of drawings of people on uh, on the train without them knowing, and mm -hmm. I think about that every day of like as I'm sketching someone, you know, would they be okay with me sketching this image? You know, would they be okay with me using their uh, using their image, you know, in a sketch that I'm going to post online? And so mm -hmm. there's this kind of surreptitious thing where, you know, I thought about, um, you know, how is it that I can better, you know, advertise the fact that I'm actually drawing people without losing that moment. Um, so when you ask about, like, whether or not glass, you know, I should be posting photos of someone who's on, like, a train, obviously there's the permission of public space, but I don't think that that's socially enough of a contract to, um, to do so without people's permission. So mm. I think that there's, there has to be some, some discussion about where those boundaries are and I don't think that we've had enough of a, of a discussion as a community in general, just like just the world hasn't figured out what those boundaries for when is it okay to take someone's picture and when is it not. Um, mm. And once those boundaries are, are established better on a social contract level, I think it'll be much easier for us to actually work within this, uh, within the world of online because mm -hmm. it, this is so new. I mean, we're, we're talking about like, you know, the last 10 years have been explosive around, um, how the internet has has grown, and these social contracts can take decades to actually work themselves out. So but where do we fall in that? It's a really great question. Partially part of the question that I'm asking also, Myla, is if we dig a little deeper, is around not just of other people who are the subject, we've been talking in an artistic context as well, not people who are just the subject of you being the wearer, but also of the fact that under the terms and conditions of, of Google Glass with yourself as the wearer, what, have you given any thought to what um, Google can do with that camera if it, if it needs to? And I raised, this, I raised this as a question partially with another, in another interview around, let's say for instance, if there is a, uh, a, you know, a civic disturbance, uh, a terrorism threat or something, um, have you given any thought as to what Google can do with your device if you have it on in a certain location? Um, you know, I think that that's, it's a really interesting thing to think about um, surveillance versus surveillance. 
and the ideas of um, you know, like you think about surveillance as being somebody outside looking looking in. So, you know, could Google or the government or the NSA or any of these different government agencies, could they utilize that footage to um, to then you know look for something or use it to their advantage? But in the same in the same way, there is the advantage of the of the user of having that footage. You know, so if I'm recording footage and I see somebody being attacked, I might actually be able to help that person in a way that. I couldn't before because I'm able to access that footage immediately. Mm -hmm. So the question mm -hmm. is around where is that boundary, and you know when is it usable and when is it not usable? I think that really requires um, you know like a deeper conversation around you know when should somebody be able to activate it. But mm -hmm. as of right now, I mean, like I was watching one of the earliest uh, apps for Google Glass, which was around a firefighter being able to utilize um, street cameras to see traffic mm -hmm. patterns. Um, you know, so they could actually look up with Google Glass, look at a street camera, and then activate the view of that street camera because they're publicly accessible street cameras. Mm -hmm. You think about how much that uh, a firefighter being able to see that information um, can get to the fire faster, maybe save somebody's life. So, mm -hmm. you know, where is the balance between you know our accessibility to information on the good and the bad? And as developers, it's not really our place to have that full discussion. It's our place to develop the technologies and let society tell us where those boundaries or limits are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that'll really shake out pretty quickly. Um, I think people oftentimes really push this idea of personal privacy versus public good, and that's like the what's going kind of back and forth. And of course, then there's the idea of is somebody using it to uh, to get to me, you know, are they they trying to use it uh, for ill will? Um, mm. You know, all of those things are possible. Somebody could exploit technology in in a, in a way that is that is not good for people. But I think they can already do that with the technology that we exist that exists right now. Mm. I mean, we're, I'm sitting here with a webcam in my house, and you know, if you were a good hacker, you could probably turn that webcam on any time that you wanted to. Mm. Uh, but uh, just because it's on glass, the glass gives kind of a more personal interaction in, in everyday life. So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. And it's I think we've gone for a long period of time if we interrogated that. That's just it's an interest area within the research that I'm doing. But I'm really interested in the types of I have a few few colleagues who are very much into gaming and. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where you see the future of, of gaming and glass going. Where, where is it heading? Well, my experiments with, uh, with glass and, and also with mobile gaming have really been around location-based gaming. So games that actually get you out, get you into public spaces, and have mm. you interact with other mm. people on a real-time mm. basis. And you know, this idea of location-based gaming mm. has been... Um, the mobile world has been flirting with location-based uh, gaming for a long time, but it's become very uh, frustrating for people with ha to always have to have their cell phone out, to have to constantly be interacting in that way, having to hold the phone up and uh, and walk around. Whereas with glass, because it's actually integrated into uh, something that you're wearing, you can actually have that real-time location-based gaming happen without much effort. So I think that the gaming can actually um, it can take a step forward in that. A lot of these location-based games can actually happen in real time without you thinking. That you're walking along and suddenly you get a prompt saying, "Oh, there's another player nearby. Do you want to do you want to interact with them?" Um, or if you're going to a location that is that's important to the game, um, you know, one of the one of the game ideas that we worked on uh, at one point was a it was a zombie survival game, in mm -hmm. which you were actually running around in a city, and if you came close to somebody else who was a quote zombie you actually would have an interaction with them on your mobile phone. Well, that was very difficult to have to pull your phone out and you know open up the app and wait for everything to load and then you have to interact with everything. But with Glass, it could just notify you, oh, you know, suddenly you could see an image and then you could interact uh, immediately. Wow. So mm -hmm. the, um, the balance between the time, it's all about the time between when you get the not notification and you actually can act. Um, that is, it's reduced significantly when you're looking at glass. So Definitely. I think that's going to be, it, it'll, it'll be really fun once you get into get engaged in those kind of large-scale, real-time, location-based games um, mm -hmm. through a technology that allows you to do it without effort. Well, speaking of one of the biggest um, live uh, gaming environments, such as Ingress, uh, are you involved in that area at all? 
So I'm actually not, uh, I'm currently, because I'm, I'm working on some projects on my own, I'm, I've been taking a step away from the, uh, the, the large multiplayer uh, gaming uh, areas right now. And that's mostly because I want to uh, kind of keep myself in a, in a space in which I can concentrate on my art and actually um, get some of these projects off the ground. So um, although I would really love to be playing and uh, love to be interacting, I'm not, uh, I'm not currently doing that. I, I understand the affliction of work <laughs> and, and art sometimes just don't come together. You've got to prioritize certain things and sometimes that's what makes work. Art works work as well. I'm interested... Um, also, Myla, whether you have had any or know of any interaction between, say, Google Project Tango, uh, and really, can you imagine a day when Glass, you know, could possibly be the biggest Google map maker in the world? I think that that those um, those types of projects are incredible. Mm -hmm. That the idea of of distributing and basically making it that it, that the society as a whole can update things is so much more efficient than having cars roll around on the street to take photographs or having, uh, you know, the it's just a very inefficient way of mapping. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, having people who are on the ground and walking through through neighborhoods and going through their their local day to day um, areas, volunteering that information, volunteering those photos is really um, it's much more powerful in that way. Uh, I think that as a society, that you know, mapping. And, uh, and location-based mapping is, is really important to everyone. And when I'm going over the bridge in San Francisco and it tells me that I'm over the water because it hasn't yet seen the fact that the bridge has moved and that there's actually a new bridge uh, in place, that frustrates me as a consumer and as a, as a citizen. Like, why is my, na my map not up to date? And that's really because they haven't done another flyby of the, of the area. They haven't driven another car over the, over the bridge and they still think that we're on the old bridge rather than the new one. Mm -hmm. You've just answered. You've just answered. Sorry to interrupt. You've just you've just answered for me. Um, probably a five-year question. Um, you know that it, it consolidates for me that uh, your view that that people are very efficient map makers, and that this device could contribute towards that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Marla. This is a question which is also very dear to my heart in terms of my occupation and background. What can you envisage Google Glass being used for in an education and training context? Oh, I think this is one of the areas that is the is the most broad as far as being able to have real time interaction. Um, I think that one of the thing one of the biggest barriers to education is um, is location and proximity to in, to instruction, um, and also having to look away from what you're doing in order to to gain instruction. So if I'm a, if I'm sculpting and I'm learning how to sculpt, um, you know, normally I would have to go to a teacher. I'd have to have them right there with me, you know, showing me how to do things. And if I wanted to actually look away at, at, at something that to get a reference to a model or a reference to a piece of art, I actually have to leave my sculpture and then come back. And with Google Glass, what we what we end up doing is you have a camera that I could share a video of what I'm seeing to you. So you could be in Australia or you could be in, in England or you could be anywhere and see what I'm working on through my eyes um, and then with that display back information um, that's contextual to what I'm doing um, to what I can see. So if you're sharing, you know, you could shoot, put something up to a camera, you could show something or you could have a model that you're, that you're showing off and say, okay, take a look at the structure of this um, in the camera, so I don't have to look away. I just look up for a second, get the information, and I can talk to somebody through the whole process. So in mm -hmm. that education moment, you take something that before would have been a disparate and difficult um, thing to overcome and make it something that is natural and can actually be a real interactive experience. Now add on to that, um, you know, they're, they're talking about devices that people would be able to manipulate using their mobile phone, you know, for example, like mobile arms or things like that. You could even get even more into that where, you, you know, I can actually show you what I'm seeing. You could actually interact with the environment, which I think some folks are actually working on in conjunction with Google Glass is using those kind of uh, relationship technologies and um, being able to have somebody actually reach into your space. So I think that once we reach that point, then education becomes limitless because we can actually interact 
over, you know, over great distances to learn things from the best instructors. And already that's what we do in the arts. We reach out to people no matter where they are in the world and we try to learn from them. So now put on top of that recorded technology where I can watch a video while I'm, while I'm sculpting and you know, that's, that just puts the icing on the cake. So I think limitless, limitless possibilities. Profound, and and you will be quoted many times on what you've just stated <laughs> to my to my question. Um, it's it's an absolute pleasure to hear uh, how these connects can be brought together in a, a meaningful and, and uh, proactive and uh, intelligent way. On an everyday level, Myla, your commutes every day. You talked about being on the train and people interacting with you, and really feeling quite impassioned to come and speak with you even though they don't know who you are. How, you know, how, how is the public basically dealing with this uh, glass device? Are they aware of how many there are or, um, or are they aware of what it actually is? How do they know about it? Well, I think right now that the, that the rarity of glass is, makes it a very, um, it, it makes it a very unique experience because the fact that even in San Francisco, um, you know, I have not once on my train ride run into another person who's wearing Google Glass. So I travel every day 45 minutes on the train each way, and I don't run into other people who are wearing uh, wearing glass, even though I'm I'm out there and I'm you know being very public. So mm -hmm. that tells me that the saturation in a in a city that has you know just so many people who are who actually have the device already. That the saturation is at a very low point right now, and so people are really unaware. So the reactions that I get from folks when they see glass are are definitely very varied, but um, mostly people are really excited at the at just the idea that technology this technology exists, even to the point of someone you know some people having these reactions of like what year is this you know uh, are we living in the future you know is this is this the point at which we're we're hitting that threshold where Technology is integrating into our everyday life. Um, there are people who have adverse reactions. Um, definitely, I see people sometimes will get up and move seats because they're uncomfortable with being in my view, which I find very odd because I'm not usually not recording. And when I do record, I'm doing it for a very specific purpose, and I'm very visual about it. So I'll actually, you know, make a, a big point that I'm recording or that I'm uh, that I'm taking a picture. Um, and it's usually as my own personal reference, so I'm not um, I'm not typically putting this uh, this information out online, um, mm -hmm. with the very rare exception of if I am doing a sketch of someone and I'm posting it to my personal uh, you know Google uh, Google Plus account, I might put the sketch and the person together, you know, to show um, you know how I've rendered the structure or things like that. But um, it's very interesting to see how people react in that way, but I think most people are impassioned and, and really excited about the technology, but they don't really know um, and very much about it. I get some very simple questions around, you know, like, are you recording? You know, what can it do? Can I try it on? You know, those kind of questions where people are just uh, really exploring what it is. Mm -hmm. um, as they get more and more um, out there and more and more saturated in the population, I think that, that there will be less and less questions about them. Absolutely, and that was my final question for you, Myla. I'm very appreciative of you meeting with me today. When you say, or when I coined the question of when glass becomes commonplace in the home, uh, at work, in the street, in the shopping centre, in the club, do you agree this is going to happen? And if it is going to happen, uh, what do you think the likely impact on humanity at large is going to be? Um, I think that it is inevitable that wearable technology will um, will integrate into our everyday life, um, and that the eventuality is that um, that everyone will see the see a benefit to wearable technology, um, whether that's through Google Glass or whether it's through other types of augmented reality. The possibilities are so um, are so endless and so amazing to uh, to actually integrate those things into people's lives that you're going to see uh, at some point a tipping point in which people are able to both afford um, and actually have all the functionality to utilize these in their everyday life. At mm. that point, you're going to see a lot less people distracted sitting in, the, in their phones, a lot more people actually having conversations. So I think that we can move from a state of being glued to our technology to actually having technology enhance our lives. Um, and that's kind of my dream for, uh, for the future is that technology can 
augment our lives, can make our lives better, rather than uh, constricting us into a small, tiny little screen. Fantastic final note, uh, Libby. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at this um, pop-up that's coming on the top here. Libby Chang is going to join me um, a little later on today, who's discussing what she's doing within the context. Have you had much contact with Libby at all? Um, so I've had a little bit of contact with Libby, but mostly with uh, Cecilia. Um, you know, I think that the the group that the group that's been working on a lot of these technologies has been um, pretty uh, pretty tight knit, um, and I'm I'm really fascinated. I follow Libby's uh, work a lot uh, on on G plus, and mm. uh, I think that you know what's happening in that with that circle of folks is really powerful. Um, they're pushing boundaries. Um, you know, they are all working on things to actually make Google Glass something that is um, really easy and effective to use. And I think that's really mm -hmm. important to what you're talking about with the integration and rollout into everyday life. People need applications. People need uh, functionality that, uh, that will actually make things really um, interactive in their everyday life. So I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. I'm very proud of the work that you've been doing as well, and I'm really uh, appreciative, again, of you joining us. This uh, video will be broadcast to a, a wide audience uh, of not only people interested in the technology itself, but within the impact that it will have socially and in potentially to the applications that, it, that may be um, integrated with that particular technology. So thank you very much, Myla, for joining me today. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.